So the first talk of the second half of the morning, um, we have Joydeep Bagji, who's going to tell us about kiloparsec scale radio jets from spiral galaxies. Okay, thank you. So thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting conference. So I'm honored to be here. Uh, so today, as, I, uh, as you know, I'll be talking about something very unusual that <coughs> spiral galaxies generally don't produce radio jets, we all know. But I will tell something, what are the things we have recently seen in these objects? And what are the most important thing, I won't tell what are the things I know, but what are the things we need to know? That's more important. So, because this field is just emerging. So actually, we all know from years of radio astronomy history, from the years, uh, from the uh, 1964, I think, first paper by Morgan and Schmidt, etc., that all these powerful radio jets originate in elliptical galaxies. And when you identify the radio sources in the sky since that time, they never ever <coughs> seem to be correlated with spiral galaxies due to some reason. So there must be some huge astrophysical reason why this is happening. But this is uh, completely unknown. Why? So here is the long-standing mystery of this Aegean phenomenon that we don't see radio jets, big radio jets at least, uh, 100 kiloparsecs and bigger, emerging from spiral galaxies. So there must be something very peculiar happening in the nuclei of this galaxy, because we know we need a supermassive black hole to produce a very big jet. So what is the conditions, or what is the uh, uh, peculiar astrophysical conditions required to launch a supermassive black hole? Maybe these objects are very important. So I'll just uh, summarize that why spiral galaxies, so central mystery. So essentially the mystery lies in the center. So. So actually it's a central mystery that why spiral galaxies never produce large scale radio jets. <coughs> and it's a related thing that why powerful radio galaxies and radio loud quasars all originate in bulge dominated systems. So now we know that there is a one to one correspondence between the mass of the black hole and the uh, luminosity of the mass of the bulge. So then it may be telling us something about the origin of the black hole and the evolution of the black hole. That is one of the school of thoughts. And uh, lastly, we know that if we, there are no radio jets, obviously there will be radio, radio quiet. But some of the spiral galaxies are uh, quite bright objects in terms of their Aegean characteristics. So you see Sifford like nucleus, you see quasar like activity, uh, which is very uh, strange that you need a very high accretion flow, very high massive black holes to do this. But they don't produce radio emission. So this is one of the very uh, interesting uh, unsolved mysteries, which I think is still not solved, and we need to study these objects in a great detail to understand what is happening. So there has been various conjectures that the radio jet launching from Aegean may require some extremely specific fundamental conditions, that unless these conditions are met, you cannot launch a radio jet. So yesterday, Sasha had shown some very interesting simulations. <laughs> Uh, what kind of conditions you require. So he mentioned that uh, one of the key drivers of black hole uh, radio jet formation is a spin of the black hole and uh, perhaps uh, accretion rate of the black hole, uh, accretion rate of the matter falling into the black hole, essentially the magnetic field which is being uh, eaten up by the black hole inside this, what is the in, <coughs> uh, advection of magnetic field in the event horizon. So there has been various conjecture that spin and mass may be the two important characteristics. And also we know that there has been certain papers that there's a magic number like 3 into 10 to the 8 Mson or 10 to the 9 Mson. If you cut off the black hole mass below that, there are no radio jets, which is also something very unusual. Uh, why it should happen? So there are various papers which have mentioned these kind of things. So you can see the, what are the striking differences between spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies. Other than optical differences, they are obvious. So they are very faint in radio luminosity. But elliptical galaxies, those which are radio loud, have a very high radio luminosity. And there are no large scale radio jets. Well, here you see large scale radio jets. And generally, it is uh, believed that small black holes exist in the center of spiral galaxies. And very high mass black holes exist in the center of elliptical galaxies. Now, these two things are completely unknown. Uh, maybe the this black hole is spinning very slowly in the center of spiral galaxies. And 
in the center of elliptical galaxy, the black hole being very high mass, maybe it has merged and acquired a lot of angular momentum if it is merged in a right uh, vectorial addition. Because angular momentum is a vector and um, mass is a scalar. So you keep on adding mass, but it will not add to the spin unless you add to the, add the two vectors. And also we know that some of the spirals are very active, so these are called Seifert galaxies, which are believed to be accreting at a very high Eddington, Eddington rate. So those are called uh, Seifert 1 type black, black holes. And here elliptical galaxies, most of the elliptical galaxies in the present universe are ex extremely low, um, radiatively extremely low efficiency. I mean, you don't see any radiation. If you see the optical spectrum, you won't find any indication that there is something special happening, unless it's a BL lac or a broad line radio galaxy. So most of the elliptical galaxies in our local universe are all at the state of a very low accretion, which is also very interesting. So now I'll come to the striking evidence which has been seen uh, over the years. The so first very interesting and absolutely stunning example was discovered by Ledlow, Owen, and it's actually Bill Keel and their group, which was published. Uh, this is a VLA image. So you can see a huge radio jet emerging out of this spiral galaxy. And there is no doubt it's a spiral galaxy. There's a more than 100 kiloparsecs, something like 250 kiloparsec scale radio jet was seen, which actually everybody sat up and took note of this, that this must be something extraordinary happening. So what is this kind of object? Because this goes against everything which was known in the radio astronomical um, uh, literature. But since then, there were no discoveries after many, many years. There was just no object was seen. But recently, I'm very happy to tell that there has been very pioneering effort made by some Indian researchers who have brought into forefront this field and discovered many objects of this type. Where you see uh, extremely large scale jets uh, going up to one megaparsec and above, which is absolutely stunning. And these are highly realistic jets. Uh, uh, and these amazing sources, like these are very interesting sources, may contain the fundamental clue that what is exact condition required for launching of a radio jet. Because if we study these nuclei of these objects in great detail with various kind of um, wavelengths and various kind of telescopes, maybe we will get a clue for understanding the radio jet formation. And maybe a, a puzzle, uh, answer to the long standing puzzle of why ra large scale radio jets are almost never made in flat spiral galaxies, but they are always made in big elliptical galaxies. So there are many papers. I'm sorry if I missed some papers, but these are the some recent papers which have discussed this. So here is the first clear example. There are only two examples. Currently there are no other example. I'll be very happy to know if you have come across any other example where you can see a megaparsec scale radio jet in a spiral host. So the first example was discovered by Anand Hota. Uh, where he found, uncovered this extremely am amazing object with a 1.3 megaparsec scale, double, double, double something, uh, three episodes of emission. Uh, this was one of the objects he published. And recently, my group has also found this extremely interesting object with a 1.6 megaparsec scale, double, double radio source. The double, double means that two episodes of radio emission. So you see an inner jet pair and you see an outer jet pair. And the GMRT has been very powerful in this uh, uncovering these sources, because what we required is a high sensitivity for low energy emission, like it's a low frequency emission. So we could see the relic radio lobes, which were generally not visible in uh, high frequency emission. So the GMRT was absolutely necessary to see this, these things. Of course, this is the VLA picture, uh, but if you see in v uh, GMRT, then these lobes are very steep spectrum. And this, uh, this object is also shows very steep spectrum lobes. So we don't understand what is going on here. But you can see it's a very clearly it's a spiral galaxy. There's no doubt about. So and, it's huh? Loud. Pardon? It's radio loud. Radio loud, of course. It's, yeah, huge really radio loud. And these are the, all the um, rogues gallery of the objects that has been seen still so far. So I, there are only seven objects known till now. Uh, so here are the, the first object 
Bill Keel's famous object. And this is the um, J2345, largest radio jet uh, so far known. And this Anand Dhota has found this one, which is also the same order. And Videsh Singh and his group has found several others recently. So you, you can see there is a, the field is still emerging. You are finding objects of this type. And very interesting uh, physics is uh, surely hidden in these objects. So here is just like a catalog of the objects. You can see all of them are spiral galaxies without any doubt. You can see spiral arms and sometimes uh, evidence of mergers, dust lanes, everything. And the size of these objects currently range from uh, 100 to 1.6 megaparsec, 100 kiloparsec to 1.6 megaparsec. So these are the only things, uh, the only objects that I know currently. So now this is the question that what kind of spiral would you expect that should eject a huge, that means a 100 kiloparsec scale or bigger relativistic jet? So the answer is still unclear because we have so little number, of, so less number of objects currently known and only few confirmed examples are there. So they're exceptionally rare phenomena, exceptionally rare. So you have to survey something like 10 to the power five galaxies if, if you, when you come across one of them. That's kind of statistics I feel. And probably we have two important clues here. Uh, perhaps Sifford galaxies are the objects which have the conditions uh, in the nuclei which can produce radio jets uh, in spiral uh, disk-like environment. And these are small scale radio jets. Currently, we don't know any Sifford galaxy which is emitting very big radio jet. So all these radio jets are less than kiloparsec scale. And due to some mysterious reason, the two objects that I mentioned, which are exceeding one megaparsec, are they extremely massive spiral, extremely unusual, uh, extreme kind of objects. So I'll just tell you what is the extreme nature of these objects uh, by giving you an example of the object that I studied. And they seem to be ejecting large scale, megaparsec scale radio jets. So these kind of things currently, I believe is quite clear. But this has to be verified. Are there more objects which are not extreme spirals? I mean, it's extremely massive, bright, big scale spirals, which can produce megaparsec scale jets. So th this we have to actually study more. Now, here is some astrophysical reason. I mean, why you should be excited to see this? Okay, let it be a spiral galaxy is producing a radio jet. So I don't care about it. It's like a radio jet. But why it should be excited about it? So first, it's not just because they are so rare. Uh, this is what I mentioned earlier, so um, they may have a major clue hidden in the nucleus that behavior of radio jets in disk environment. Generally, radio jets are found in the bulge kind of environments. Of course, there's accretion disk, but I'm not talking about accretion disk, I'm saying large scale environment. So, so how does the radio jet and black hole formation happens in the disk environment? And at this common, uh, low redshift, we, we don't see this uh, this kind of uh, activity quite frequently, as I told you, it is very rare. But when you go to high redshifts, so most of the black holes and the stellar disks were created at higher redshifts. Uh, when, the, when the star formation and black hole growth were simultaneously taking place. So if you study these objects presently, you can also connect these objects to the larger redshift objects. That how did they evolve from larger redshifts? I mean, so essentially, it has a clue towards uh, to the, its black hole growth as well as the growth of the galaxy. I think these all aspects have to be studied together. So this connection between black hole and disk host-like systems uh, can be also one of the field of study. And as I told you that we have a feeling that perhaps extreme spirals, these extremely massive spirals are very important as drivers of megaparsec scale radio jets. So I have no clue why it is happening. Uh, we, we can study more and then understand it. So this we know very well that there are radio jets and relativistic phenomena going on in the nuclei of Sifford galaxy, the most active type of galaxies, which show all kind of uh, emission line activity from infrared to UV to X-rays. And optical spectrum shows both narrow and broad lines, those who uh, those who have not seen this, are, many people are aware of this, the experts here, but just for completion I'm telling you. And several radio studies find that few Sifford may have extended radio structures and kiloparsec scale. 
but these structures never exceed greater than 10 kiloparsecs. Uh, okay, so then we have a huge mystery here also that why Sifford galaxies are unable to launch 100 kiloparsec to megaparsec scale relative ejects, while narrow line Sifford 1 galaxies are extremely active and they have powerful relativistic jets uh, as inferred from their gamma ray emission. So here there is a dichotomy. There's a Faustian is uh, gamma ray observations and his review article have taken this graph. So you can see the radio quiet and radio loud divide. It's very clear here. Uh, on the, this axis you have got gamma ray, MeV gamma ray flux detected by Fermi and you have 1.4 gigas radio flux. And you can see there is kind of a correlation. Well, these objects are all blazars, very powerful, highly accreting, um, massive black holes, which are not in uh, spiral galaxies. Uh, and these are the narrow line Sifford galaxies, which are gamma ray emitting, and these are upper limits. So you can see they have a similarity with blazars, but they are not quite that radio loud. They are much less radio loud compared to blazars. So there are some possibilities what is what could be happening here. The first thing we might be seeing through the radio jet along the axis of the radio jet. That's why we may not see large scale radio jets and we are seeing a highly relativistic beamed uh, version of a radio jet. Or other thing which could be happening that there is a mass of the black hole in the center of these uh, Sifford galaxies is quite small and you need a very massive black hole to allow a powerful big jet to form. So there could be a cutoff in the mass, that you have to have a mass bigger than that to launch a very powerful relativistic jet. Or there may be some very unknown uh, astrophysical phenomena or astrophysical processes operating, that is a disk jet coupling in the spiral galaxies. So this is also completely uh, unknown and quite amazing, uh, mysterious type of objects currently, which is, a, we heard many talks in this conference about these. So okay, I will not go into this, I just described to you. But just quickly I'll tell you that this, these are the narrow line Sifford galaxies and I feel there are some connection between these two. But we do, I don't know what is exactly the connection. And here on this side you have extremely massive galaxies. And these are known to launch megaparsec scale radio jets. Well these are compact core dominated. And here you can have, uh, in two examples at least, you have uh, FR2 relativistic jets. But here in this case, you have uh, only small uh, compact jets or core only. And also it has been suggested by some studies that these Sifford's are actually pseudo bulge. They don't have a well-developed bulge and they contain less massive black holes. While in this case also in one example at least we are finding there is a pseudo bulge system the galaxy is not a bulged system and uh, possibly it hosts a supermassive black hole. And uh, this narrow line Seifert galaxy obviously to produce such uh, gamma ray emission and relativistic flows, you need a, a very high accretion rate. Also it comes from I think some other modeling. Uh, Eddington rate should be very high, close to 0.1 to 1. While here you need a very low Eddington rate due to various reasons. Now here I am just highlighting the two objects that we have recently seen. Uh, both contain radio jets on greater than one megaparsec scale. And both are extremely massive fast rotating spirals. So, so we don't understand why. So this is the first object that Hota has discovered in a few years back. Uh, it is rotational speed of this spiral, host spiral, that uh, disk rotation is something like 350 kilometers per second, which is extremely high uh, compared to our Milky Way, it is very high. Well, object that I have studied, the rotation speed is something like 430 kilometers per second, which is one of the highest known. I think only one galaxy known in the entire astrophysics, which is higher than this, something like 500 kilometers per second. So this is something very spectacular, I don't understand what is the connection between large scale, uh, large scale properties of the galaxy and a central massive black hole and the jet formation. So there is a clue here. I'll just tell you the properties of this object, uh, this object, because I know it better than this one. 
Um, I'll just tell you what I published in my AppJ papers, just like summary of that, and some new information we have recently got from Chandra. So this paper we published, you must have seen this paper. It's an astrophysical journal, uh, and these are all my collaborators. <laughs> okay. So here we have a, a picture of this uh, um, ra radio emission on various scales, and this is a spiral galaxy. And I, I just summarized these properties to you. And here you can see the rotation curve taken from Giravli, uh, Ayuka Giravli 2 meter telescope. And you can see this absolutely stunning distortion in the spectral lines due to Doppler effects. And you can see that this galaxy is extremely massive if you just fit a dynamical mass to this object. Even within 10, 20 kiloparsecs, you will get something like 10 over 12 m sun, which is very, very high. And if you put it in the Taliefisher relation, then you can calibrate it and you can estimate its virial mass up to M200, so which will be come out to something like 10 over 13 m sun. So it's one of the most massive spirals uh, known uh, till now. So obviously that this spiral disk has acquired a huge mass and angular momentum. So I'm just talking about the dynamics of the whole galaxy. Uh, I'm not concerned about currently the central massive black hole. So there are two ways of acquiring this. One is tidal torques and another is coplanar accretion. So you can torque it by uh, bringing two galaxies together and uh, merging them, or you can accrete slowly in a single plane so that you can get a lot of angular momentum addition and fast rotating disk. So these are the standard models of galaxy formation. And another thing which we found that it is a pseudo bulge, as I told you. So this is a bulge disk decomposition. So you can clearly there is no uh, extended bulge component. It's very clearly, it's a Sersic index is something like one. So those who are uh, know about it, they will immediately recognize it as a pseudo bulge. So this is something uh, I won't go into. It's just like a theoretical idea that how do you acquire a black hole um, a galaxy with a uh, angular momentum? How do you feed galaxy with the angular momentum and mass? At the early epochs when the halo formation was taking place and the, it was acquiring from the intergalactic, pristine matter from the intergalactic space. So this is a numerical simulation. You can see these are all cold flows into the central uh, halo where the spiral galaxy is forming. So it will be, uh, currently we believe that the merger route is not favored because we don't see a bulge system. Otherwise you will get a bulge. So somehow it has avoided being uh, going through a merger route. So it must have evolved something like, uh, we, I don't know much about it, I'm just conjecturing it. It must have evolved through cold flows in a streams. Uh, so, okay, so I'll not go into this. Now here we have recently observed this galaxy with Chandra X-ray telescope uh, with the Cambridge group with Andrew Fabian and his collaborators. So what we expected, uh, we see it actually. We expected a hot halo of X-ray gas around the spiral galaxy because it's being so massive, you expect a hot halo, uh, like an elliptical galaxy. Generally, if you see a spiral galaxy, you won't see this halo because they're so low mass. And because of the formation process, it must have acquired a lot of baryons. We must have got shocked and infall of the baryons, or maybe feedback, I don't know. Both the processes might be operating. So actually, Fabian suggested that we should look at this object with Chandra X-ray telescope, and you have to see this X-ray halo. And we are seeing it, actually. So this paper we published in MNRS recently. Uh, so this X-ray halo is not very well detected in Chandra, even 100 kilosecond observations. So we are now doing a more detailed observation with XMM. So okay. So, it's, it's, so the story rests here currently. And now I won't go into this. So X, as I told you, this will be a low excitation radio galaxy. If I just put it hard castles and this wise color, color, and color radio plane, then it will fall here. It will fall here in the domain of spirals and low excitation radio galaxies. So, okay, so there has been various conjectures that this low excitation radio galaxy that uh, Martin also discussed, that you need uh, something like advection dominated accretion flow to form a big radio jet because the funnel and all kind of theoretical requirements are there. 
So I won't go into this, but you need a very uh, low accretion rate if this model is correct. I don't know whether this model is um, applying to this black hole or no. So just, just like a conjecture currently, I would say. So the strong link between radio jet and accretion rate has been suggested in the literature. Uh, so this is just one of the conjectures. So I won't go into this scenario. I just told you the elements of this. Uh, it's a, maybe a, a low accreting mag black hole and which will be driving the central engine with the adapt stage uh, through the and the high, uh, launch of high power radio jets. And then it may be, this growth might have taken place at a very high rate accretion rate in the early universe because it has to accrete at a very high rate in order to form a massive black hole in short time. So it must have shown like a luminous quasar in the early universe. So the, if you want to see the precursor of these kind of galaxy, they will be looking like quasars uh, in a elliptic a spiral disks. And this must be an extinguished quasar where the accretion rate has gone down. And then you should, in future, you should also search for more objects like this. Because this is a Fermi has seen in our Milky Way spiral galaxy. You have seen this picture many times. There's a huge bubbles of radio and gamma ray emitting bubbles. So this could be telling that our spy, uh, Milky Way spiral was also a uh, AGN at some stage, like a maybe radio jet emitting AGN. Of course, it's a cartoon. It's not a real picture. <laughs> so don't believe it's a real picture. OK. So one should see these kind of things search more, I, will, I believe, in spiral galaxies, which will give us a clue about the past activity of the radio jets. And OK, so GMRT, LOFAR, et cetera, can be used for this. And we need to use all type of telescopes uh, to understand what is happening in the center of this uh, ultra luminous, ultra massive uh, black hole em radio jet emitting spiral. So here is, there is a picture of AstroSat, which is a recently launched uh, UV X-ray, hard X-ray, soft X-ray satellite by India. So I think this can do uh, wonders if we object study these objects like this. And Chandra, we have already used VLA. Uh, ALMA can be used to study the rotation curve of the inner spiral, inner disk, uh, near the black hole sphere of influence. Actually, you have to go to near the black hole sphere of influence. Of course, HST proposal we have already submitted, and it's also accepted now. So next year, we'll get an HST picture. And simulation like what Sasha is doing and others are doing, this can also be very powerful for this understanding these galaxies. So OK. So I've come to the end of my talk. The summary is this. You can read it. OK. And we have questions. <laughs> so uh, it would be interesting to, to know the, or to measure somehow the jet kinetic power in those, in those yes. sources, because they are effort to like. Yes. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if if the powers are even typical of, of FR ones, because once once you get out of the yeah. of the of the bulge in a spiral galaxy, yes. you're out, and and the morphology you got is is very typical of uh, yeah. numerical simulations in which you put too much jet power or too low external density, and you have a bullet. Uh, so it would be interesting to to check that. That's you that's where the, the ambient medium is going to be important. Yeah. Actually, I calculated. I tried to calculate from radio. Um, Radio luminosity versus uh, kinetic power co correlation. Like if you measure 150 megahertz total flux of the radio lobes, <laughs> so it's essentially these radio lobes are storing the energy, uh, outer radio lobes. Yes. So you can calculate so it's something like 10 to the 44 ergs per second, which I don't know how how good it is. <laughs> so I calculated it and I try to fit all this uh, Blanford and Zenic model, which I don't believe is very realistic. So I didn't show you this. Realistic means for this object, my modeling. I didn't say the model is wrong. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was quite impressive, and I was happy to see in the sense that uh, we are seeing jets for spirals, and uh, so that at least we could do a comparison. And I would like you to comment on the following three things. Of course, you show the mass of the overall galaxy. Yeah. But can you can you can you in a, can you put in a picture the the the, uh, the spirals uh, for which we see jets, and uh, can you compare that with the extra galactic objects like the yeah? Pillars? I don't know about the other objects. I'm like not. Like the black hole mass. These objects are completely unknown to me. One has to study the rotation curve of these galaxies. I don't know anything about these objects because uh, this is not a fast rotating. This is like 220 kilometers per second. 
rotation speed. This galaxy, because they, they, they have measured 21 centimeter. So one, what has to do, one has to do is to map these objects in 21 centimeter H1 line and see the rotation curve. So I don't, I don't know, maybe you are right. Uh, maybe some of the object will turn out to be not fast rotating. Because they, uh, of course, there will be correlation, Tully-Fisher relation. If you can put it directly on Tully-Fisher relation, and you can see a correlation between their rotation rate and luminosity. So right, right now you know the luminosity. You can put it on the Tully-Fisher relation. You can actually predict their uh, rotation rates. Do you think these objects? I have not done that. Since they are nearby, do you think that they could be promising uh, candidates for high high, high resolution VLBI as well? Do you high, think they, high resolution? Yeah, like high frequency VLBI. Oh yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. They are right in the absolutely yes. Okay. Because the central nucleus must be very uh, bright, and you should see some jet formation yes. in the nucleus. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <coughs> so, uh, what strategy is being followed to increase the sample set? Like right now, you just have seven sources. So, any? I'm not doing anything. Uh, Pratik, my students are doing something. So actually, we are just blindly searching. <laughs> you take a catalog and uh, see some thousands of objects. I think he has found one or two more. We have to study many galaxies and just correlate with radio catalogs and see whether you can pick up some objects which have got extended radio emission. So currently, I don't know uh, how to increase the probability of detection. So you have to do a more clever search than just blind search. Yeah, so in our study, we did a kind of systematic search ah. using the STSS DR7 ah. catalog and matching it to the first and NVSS surveys. So, uh, yeah, so you need to play with the, the large catalogs. Yes, so Viresh is doing that, yes. See, in this, this is rightly showed in the sample that first object, Beal, Keels, and et al. Mm. That is low mass. Second it's one is Pekka. Yes. The third one you are showing is both of them are very massy. Yeah, and rest of the thing, what Vires and uh, Vires Singh all, except one, others are interacting or merger systems. And the, what Minimao has published, the hello is so big, the yeah. central one is only showing like a spiral exactly. pattern. Exactly. I would not call it a spiral or disk galaxy. I think this one is the one, yeah. The spiral pattern is buried inside the bulge. It's a bulge it's system. Funny. It's a, like a BCG in some sense. So in a way, we can say that the, both the massive and the mega parsec scale, Let's clean set we can take. And this spiral one, we rest in the last one, we don't know the rotation speed at the moment. Yes. So if we take the massive and the largest jet, they are falling at the extreme end. Okay. And we should not be confusing ourselves with the uh, interacting system so that the orbital plane of the merger is mimicking like the disk. And Speca is the, still the largest uh, redshift, 0.137. Rest of the, all the thing, even though Bires has looked at all the STSS sample, that is still the largest. So there may be in the, our radio galaxy sample, disk may be there, but we are missing to look at. They're too far, probably. Right. <coughs> yeah. That's a good, go up that's to a good plan, too. yeah. Good. <laughs> one, one more question. Uh, you've just been waiting. So. Um, apologies if you already answered this, but um, can you estimate the Eddington luminosity from looking at the, the AGN, the brightness of the AGN? Eddington luminosity. Um, if, if you want to find out. No, I have not done it yet. I need to know more about X-ray, I mean, bolometric, uh, bolometric I mean, luminosity can... of the, I mean, nuclear region, which I have not done yet. But I, I guess it will be low Eddington, um, because well, it's not showing any uh, characteristics of a high excitation radio galaxy. But one has to study it more, yeah. So I'm planning to do it with the higher resolution study of the nuclear region, yes. Okay, um, so Thanks. let the other speakers Thank you. keep going. Thank you. We have to keep on schedule. Thank you.